May was feeling very attached to me this morning, so sorry about getting up here a minute late. All right, we're in Amos. Most of our focus, we're going to look at a couple more things in Chapter 6 from this middle section, then we'll move into Chapter 7 through 9, and then uh, kind of wrap things up on Wednesday night. I think there's <clears throat> plenty of stuff here in these last few chapters that um, should get us through today and Wednesday night as well. Let's start with a quick word of prayer, and then we'll be in Amos chapter 6. Let's pray. God, thank you again for uh, the time that you give to us. We do uh, thank you so much for the wisdom of our elders and, and uh, forming the structure for us to have uh, these Bible classes. We're, we do pray that we use our time well. Please help us to think through what we study and to make good application and to live by what we, what, what we learn in your word. God, we love you so much. We do pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, uh, for those of our visitors here, we uh, we were going through the book of James. We spent most of this quarter going through James, and we did that a couple extra weeks. Uh, I, I had always said I don't want to just stretch something out just for the sake of filling up, you know, 12 weeks or something. You know, we study we study until we're done studying. We had a couple weeks left over, so decided to go through Amos. And it's been uh, really, really refreshing to see how much overlap there is of the themes of James and the book of Amos. Like you, you almost could say that they're like companion books from Old Testament to New Testament with how much these themes run together. So it's been nice to, I think, see some application like what we learned in James. Well, it was just as true back during the time of Amos. And if it was true when Amos was around and if it was true when James was around, well, it's still true today. So we're here in Amos chapter 6. And this middle section of the book is a series of uh, sermons or sermonettes and poems uh, that, uh, that Amos went through publicly. Uh, and so there's a couple, a couple more that I want to look at. Let's go back to chapter 6 and pick back up. I want to redo or reread 4 through 7. And then I want to take a look at a couple more things here in verses 12 through 14. So let's pick up in verse 4. Amos chapter 6 and verse 4. Those who recline on beds of ivory and sprawl on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who improvise to the sound of the harp and like David have composed songs for themselves, who drink wine from sacrificial bowls while they anoint themselves with the finest of oils, yet they've not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they will now go into exile at the head of the exiles, and the sprawler's banqueting will pass away. 
So we looked at some of the details on Wednesday night, but I want to like, there's one question that I want to ask and, and explore if you have some things that you'd like to share. And I'll give you a moment to think through because I know I'm kind of springing this question on you. It's difficult to read this and not see some application to our own lives today. We live very physically comfortable lives. We sit on comfortable chairs, comfortable couches. We sleep in comfortable beds. We wear comfortable shoes. We wear comfortable clothes. We eat food that is at the perfect temperature. We, we won't eat if it's only melted or it's lukewarm or room temperature. Everything has to be, you know, we'll pour a cup of coffee. I was like, mm, it's nice. We're, we're very, you know, we're picky. And, and we feel like we have the right to be picky because we have all these conveniences, whether it's a microwave oven or a dryer or a, a fireplace in our house. You, you flip, flick a light switch and the fireplace turns on. Like that, like imagine, imagine just like 200 years ago, 100 years ago, when people had to work for everything. And now we just go, oh, we need fire? Just click a light switch and the fireplace turns on. Okay, so it's hard not to read these verses and go, damn, that is uncomfortably a lot like my life. <clears throat> Sitting on a comfortable couch, plunking away on my guitar, I always have lots of food. There's always food in the pantry. And, and Americans, we throw away more food than most of the rest of the world would eat, <laughs> right, for a, for a Thanksgiving feast. So... My question is this, what can we do to help guard against this? Now, one answer someone might say, and I'll, I'll give you a few minutes to kind of ponder, what can we do to help guard against this? Fundamentally, the question really at its core is, what's the actual problem here? Is the problem the comfortable bed, the nice shoes, food in the pantry, is that fundamentally the problem? <laughs> Not really. So what's the attitude here? And how do we guard against that attitude from creeping in? Someone might say, well, the solution is get rid of the comfortable couch. Uh, don't compose songs on the, on the guitar. Don't have a pantry full of food. Never feast. Never have a banquet. Okay. Now, you can get rid of the conditions or the symptoms, but if you don't address the actual core problem, then all you've done is just, you know, thrown away your furniture. And can you throw away the furniture and clear all the food out of your fridge and still be left with the exact same, like, spiritual condition that you were in before? Yeah, I, I think that's that. So help me out here. How do I guard against this? condition when I live such a, a, a comparably comfortable life. Linda? Yeah. Okay. So you got to be able to look in the mirror like James chapter one tells us. You have to look in the mirror and not walk away forgetting what you look like. Right? And that's the whole point of what he says in James one is, you know, this person, the, the hearer and not the doer, he looks at the, his face in the mirror, and then when he walks away, he doesn't remember what his face looks like. And so <clears throat> we can sit in the class and go, yeah, materialism. Oh, materialism is bad. we got to be very careful. And then we, we, we just leave in our comfortable cars and go to our beautiful homes, and just nothing has actually changed. It's easy to talk about in a Bible class. It is harder to put into practice if you don't recognize that, that you have a problem. That's a great point. Recognition is point number one. I love that. Great point. Joe? Yeah, I guess just notice how many times in Bill that says mentioned uh, yeah. those four verses that say to look at me and you know, and I'll I'll share with you. One thing I struggle with is personally is I want to be a good steward of what I have been blessed with, but still be generous at the same time. Yeah. I, I, that's a that's a delicate balance for me just personally is well, I want to. I want to save, and I want to. Yeah, you know, I want to be content, but I also want to be generous. So I, that's yeah. That's something that I, you know, fight with. And let's be real about this also. <coughs> Excuse me. Are there verses that you can line up in the Bible that give you permission to enjoy the things of this world? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, James one, first of all, that recognizing every good gift and every good thing bestowed is from God, and and. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 says, uh, verses 18 through 20, 
to the one who has been given earthly blessings, God has granted permission to enjoy those earthly blessings. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, the last three verses of Ecclesiastes 2 also say, there's nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. For this is from God. It is his gift from God. So, I, I can line up verses that say, you are allowed to have a banquet and a feast and enjoy the food. You are allowed to have a beautiful home. You are allowed to plant beautiful flowers in your beautiful garden. You are allowed, of all of the things being equal, to pick comfortable shoes over uncomfortable shoes. You're allowed to do that. But I think your point is really, really good. I like that. Good point, Joe. What? Pride, isn't it? Okay, line stuff. Go to Luke chapter 12 and verses 16 through 20. In that parable of the rich man in the bigger barn, underline how many times he uses personal pronouns. In that passage, it is like shocking how how self-centered this man is. Everything is about him. Let me read you that parable and just note all the personal pronouns that are used here. Verse 17 of Luke chapter 12. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my cross? And so he says, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Like, in like four verses, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen times in four verses that that man refers to himself. Or thinks about himself. Me, 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 I, I, I. He is a completely self-centered person. So, Joe, I, again, going back to your point about, you know, they do this, they think about this, them, them, them. It's the same idea there. Is is One way that we can combat this is you can live a, a comfortable life, a nice, comfortable life. But that doesn't mean you have to make yourself the center of the universe. And as long as you're not living as the center of the universe, I think that's the core problem. Uh, Brian, you have a thought? And then Jacqueline. Yeah, Brian. yeah. so in Colossians 2.16, and this can be understood in many ways, it says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink, or with regard to a festival or new moon or Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism, <clears throat> worship. Yeah. So insisting upon you know, don't, don't let people force you to be a monk. Yeah, and, and verse 21 of the same chapter also is, don't, don't submit yourself to decrees like, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Like, if, if your whole life is about, well, you know what, the, the surest way to avoid this is, I guess I'm just going to eat like, I'm going to eat like lentils the rest of my life. I'm just going to eat lentils and I'm going to wear like, I'm going to wear burlap and eat lentils. You have to give in those situations to those that are in need. And that and that's a good point is I'm just gonna go ahead and eat lentils and wear burlap. Well, that so then you are you are voluntarily removing yourself from ever being able to practice charity with anybody. Like you, you're basically saying, like, therefore I'm gonna I'm gonna purposefully live a life where when someone needs something, I will have nothing to give. Because I am living on a subsistence purposefully. I'm not saying someone who grew up in a third world country. I'm saying you have intentionally made yourself a subsistence human being. And then when there's a need, you have purposefully closed that door on being able to help anybody. So that is a good point. I think that's a good point to me. We, yeah, we that's valid. A, we had a snowstorm in Texas and a lot of people lost power and we, we didn't. You know, Jennifer just spent days boiling water and giving it to people at church. And I was very happy that we yeah. could do that. Yeah. My brother-in-law, Brian, by the way, I have not ever met him before. Um, but that's a good point. Is, And that's what 1 Timothy 6 is all about. I mean, 1 Timothy 6 says those who are rich in this present world, just be sure you share with other people and don't fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches. It's like you can be rich. Where's your hope? Where's your focus? 
Where are you putting that emphasis? Jacqueline, go ahead. I think to answer your question, uh, my perspective is perspectives in general. Mm, yeah. Studying historically the Bible, studying historically yeah. our world. I think a lot of people don't travel <clears throat> outside of the country or the state. Yeah. So they don't, the perspective of riches is different. Yeah. Like, for instance, there are some cultures in, in Nigeria where, and I'm sure a lot, a, lot of, a lot of other places, where you have a woman who would have a lot of children. Well, when she has a friend who doesn't have any children, you give one of your kids to her to raise. And mm. that's just how it is. And we hear that, we're like, shocking. You just oh. give one of your kids, you're like, oh, you, yeah, you, when somebody doesn't have any kids, you can't have children. So I have so many, I give her one of mine to raise. And that's how they live their lives, and it's fine. But here it's just like we have this perspective of gain, gain, gather, gather, save, save. Yeah. But if we have, if we took a step out of our culture, out of our first world mindset, and said, well, what really is rich? Yeah. Over there, to have many children is wealth. So here they tell you don't have many kids. It's very expensive. Yeah. So the, <laughs> yeah. we switch our perspective. That is interesting. We switch our perspective culturally and historically, and get out of this mindset of. I need to have two point five million dollars saved for life to retire. Then say, well, let's let's change our perspective of these. If I'm a Christian, what is God saying about my mindset of that? Yeah. What is God saying about my mindset of giving, of saving, of story? And what is my purpose? Because at the end of the day, it's going to come back to our heart. Why were we doing what we were doing? Why were we saving and storing what we were saving and storing? And what was the purpose of what our lives? What, what are we living here for? Yeah. It's to live. It's to to spread the gospel, to learn about God, and to be to go to heaven one day. So what are, so what are we doing in the interim? Just yeah. making sure we live comfortably and so on. <clears throat> I, I mean, so I think it's yeah. perspective. It's a matter of opening up our mindset, studying more, getting outside of the state, <coughs> uh, learning about other cultures, and maybe it'll change all those questions that we have that we can't answer. Having more global perspective will help us have better answers and become better Christians. Yeah. I'll tell you what, there, there's a lot of places in the world where you can go on vacation and you can stay in the bubble or you can kind of get out of the bubble and maybe gain some perspective. I, I, um, we, we've not done a lot of a lot of travel abroad, but we've, we've been some places and the Caribbean is one of those places where like if you want to see the striking difference in how people live, go to the Caribbean and get away from the resort, you know, because it's like, the resorts or the, the the harbors, you know, where it's all the duty-free shopping and everything, like that's one world, but then you can go a quarter mile just outside of town and it's corrugated metal shacks. And it's just really striking how the, uh, all these islands in the Caribbean, it's like there's the cruise ship port and then the rest of the island. That's where our first congregation did all of their mission work every year. We'd go to Jamaica, not to the resort, yeah. but to like – where you're looking around like this is how people live and they're all happy and they're all you're converting people left and right because they're hungry for god and are yeah. hungry for christ so every year it was another mission trip to jamaica to baptize more and more souls and it was just like this is this is how people live and they're yeah they're happy, they're happy tell you what, that, that'll be the day I, I i have a feeling in our lifetimes it, it'll be like missionaries from sierra leone will come to right. the united states they'll be They'll be evangelizing the United yeah. States. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. That, and I agree with you 100%. It's just kind of opening your mind up a little bit. So going back to the text here, um, you, you know, you can track, I think, each of these things reclining on beds of ivory. Like, that's not necessarily sinful. Like, it's not sinful because God himself, in different points in the Bible, said, I gave you rest. And he told David, I gave you rest from your enemy. Uh, there's a whole day of the week, the Sabbath day, which is, this is your day of rest. So the idea of sitting on a couch is not inherently sinful. Um, eating lambs from the flock, well, like, you don't you know, Passover lambs. So it's not inherently sinful to eat a lamb from the flock. They did that every Passover. That, that was one of their one of their common meals, Cams from, uh, calves from the midst of the stall. Well, the father of the prodigal son, when his son came home, Hey, let go kill the fattened calf. My son is home. So it's not inherently sinful to go kill the fattened calf. Um, improvising on the harp and composing songs like David. Like, I don't see how that's inherently sinful. Like, there, you can track all these things and say, like, well, these are not necessarily sinful things that they're doing. Hey, um, uh, yeah, go ahead, Missy. Yeah, so um, great point from everybody. So application. 
So application, I go with Joe. It's overwhelming sometimes, especially yeah. being in a congregation where there's so many needs. And so I have to say, go with him on the struggle part. You struggle, you're like, oh, they need, they need, it, they need, it, they need. It. What? Yeah. So as a young person, I would say, um, don't get overwhelmed. Just pick one thing when you do that one step towards um, making a cash roll or giving someone a gift card or um, calling someone. Just take that first step. Yeah. So application. So application is they're not applying themselves. Yeah. And so yeah. it is overwhelming. So just <clears throat> And it comes with maturity, you know, and growth and getting, like Jackson said, out of your world. But so just um, – you know, just do one little step. Yeah, that's amazing. Just one step. Uh, one step makes it more comfortable to do it. Uh, the Again. next thing, you know, once yeah. you've tried something yeah. once, it gets more comfortable. Because we can talk about this and what we should do, but really, you just got to do it. You just yeah. got to take a step. Yeah. And I think it boils down to verse eight. I think verse eight. Uh, God makes a statement right in the middle of the verse, smack dab in the middle. I loathe the arrogance of Jacob. I think that's, that's kind of the heart of the whole thing. Is, and I loathe his arrogance. Uh, and it's our, it's our arrogance that blinds us to, to the needs uh, that surround us all. Well, that's in James uh, 2 and verse 6. If you have despised the poor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you despise the poor. Uh, okay, so going down to verse, uh, go down to verse 12. Let's read verses 12 through 14. This is Amos 6. Do horses run on rocks? Does one plow them with oxen? Yet you've not turned just, or excuse me, yet you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. So I think in verse 12 what he's saying is, um, anybody who has any familiarity excuse me, with horses knows that you, you have to be very, very careful with horses on, you know, unstable, uneven terrain. Uh, you know, horses, all it takes is one trip, one fall, and that's effectively the end of their life, you know, the, the lame horse. And so you don't run horses on rocks. Like that's, he's kind of like saying like, no duh. This is an obvious statement. You don't run horses on rocks. No duh. So, be careful of like I think in life like there are there are obvious things that we need to be doing. And and Israel was not even doing the obvious things. Like you have poor people, you're not doing anything about it. Um, you're in the marketplace and you're weighing things out and you're not being honest with your weight. Like those those are the obvious things. You don't have to be a priest to know how to do all that. You don't have to be some some like you know, some incredibly pious person to just know like, mm, you know. I can't cheat someone out of their pair of shoes. I can't cheat someone out of their out of their blanket that they need to sleep at night. You don't have to be someone incredibly special to know those things. So he says in verse 13, you who rejoice in Lodibar and say, have we not by our own strength taken Carnaim for ourselves? It's an interesting couple of um, references there. Lodibar is, um, that was where, you guys remember Mephibosheth? Who was Mephibosheth? Aside from having quite the fancy name, who was Mephibosheth? Jonathan. Yeah, yeah, he was Jonathan's son. He was the one that when David was looking for someone of the household of, of Saul who I can I can take care of and show some kindness to, he found Mephibosheth. And remember, Mephibosheth had, uh, had been dropped as a baby and was lame. He, he was, so he was dependent on other people for his survival. And he lived in Lodibar. That was that was where John, uh, excuse me, where Mephibosheth lived. Now I did a little bit of research. It's like, okay, what's the what's the background of Lodibar? Lodibar was actually considered kind of a ghetto town. And I don't say that word lightly. That was actually the word that was used in the in the uh, the Bible encyclopedia that I looked at. That it was considered a ghetto town. And so the fact that Mephibosheth was there is some indication that like. You know, the household of Saul had fallen on really hard times. And not only was he a member of the household of Saul during hard times, he was also someone who was handicapped member of the household of Saul. And so the only place he could go was Lodibar. It was a, it was a rough town, kind of a ghetto town. 
and that was Lodi Bar. So you who rejoice in Lodi Bar, okay, maybe what he's saying is you are rejoicing in broken things. You're, you're, you're patting yourself on the back for broken things. You're patting yourself on the back. Um, maybe what it's saying, it could also be saying that you you are rejoicing in being a ghetto town. It is possible that there were places of sin in that town. The bad part of town often attracts a certain, you know, clientele. So it could also be what he's saying. Ben? Uh, my footnote says no bar means nothing. Yeah, yeah, it means a place of nothing. I mean, yeah, it's just a place of nothing. And that's that's probably a pejorative term because it was a ghetto town. They probably just thought it was like you know other side of the railroad tracks. You know, it's a it's a place where nobody's go. Um, Mephibosheth again. Mephibosheth is he is a handicapped member of a disgraced household. Where else is he going to go? He's just going to go with all the other you know people who have no point, listless people, poor people. That's kind of what Lodi Bar was. Um, and so. Yeah, a thing of not, a thing of nothing. Um, some translations will also say like a farm with nothing. So it's just it's a place that bears nothing. It bears no fruit. It's just a it's just a place. And so he's kind of like challenging them, like like you're rejoicing in just the dead end. You're just rejoicing in in the dead end. Good for you. Great. Carnaim. Uh, Carnaim was, interestingly enough, Carnaim was a city uh, that was east of the Jordan River. So, you know, kind of outside of Israel's kind of historical, conservatively mapped out zone, uh, you know, over here. Uh, I believe it was like by the, I think it was by the Jabbok River, which is on this mm -hmm. side of the Jordan, right? Jabbok, is that where that is? Yeah. yeah. Um, but interesting thing is, he's talking about you're you're rejoicing and saying that you've taken Carnaim by your own strength. Thirty years after this was written, so 76, 760 BC, in 730 BC, Assyria comes in and conquers the city of Carnaim. So I think it's really interesting how. Is he being a little prophetic here? I think there's a little bit of prophecy here going like, you know, you're rejoicing because you're saying, hey, we took Carnaim by ourselves. Well, in about 30 years, Assyria is going to come and take Carnaim. And that's going to be a foreshadowing of Assyria coming and taking you. But I thought those were kind of interesting little references there. Uh, behold, verse 14, and it is interesting. And the reason I think Assyria means something is in the very next verse. He also prophesies that, in verse 14, I am going to raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, and they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of the Arabah. So I think the fact that Carnaim is a city that Assyria takes just 30 years after this, this prophecy happens, and, and then he mentions immediately this nation that I'm going to raise up to afflict you. We know that to be Assyria. It's just kind of a little, kind of a slant prophecy there about Assyria. Uh, okay, anything else from chapter 6 before we move on? Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Uh, I think 14 really refers back to the end of 6 and we're 10 verse 7. Because all oh, yeah, going into exile. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you go ahead and finish. I interrupted you. I was going to say, all those lists of luxuries, they weren't condemned. Yeah. What was condemned, you haven't grieved Joseph. Yeah. Or you haven't grieved over the ruin. Of, yeah. Of the, of the ruin and so forth. And because of that, yeah. not because of your luxuries. Yeah, but because you haven't worshipped. Yeah, yeah, because you're going down a bad spiritual path, but you just don't even recognize it. I think a great compliment to what you're saying is is Revelation three, and again to the Laodiceans. I think I mentioned it on Wednesday, but we didn't read it. But it's it's so striking what Jesus says to the Laodiceans in Revelation three and verse seventeen. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, but you don't know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's what he's saying here is you have all these luxuries, you're comfortable, you're at ease, and so you're not even, you're not even grieving over the ruin of Joseph. You should be grieving over your spiritual condition, but you're 
physical condition is so good that you don't even recognize the spiritual condition that you're in right now, which is what the Laodicean problem was. Well, I'm, I'm rich and comfortable and I've needed nothing. But you don't even recognize how poor and blind and naked you are. So it's amazing how, uh, again, it's not the luxuries. The luxuries are not inherently sinful. But those luxuries do provide a, they do provide quite the distraction to our spiritual condition, don't they? Right. Uh, yeah, go ahead. But also, you know, not just thinking of yourself, you have to think of the people around you. You, know? yeah. you might be the one that's got all the money, all the wealth, all the good stuff. But someone on the other hand might have nothing, and you need to, like I would say, provide for them. Yeah, and that that's kind of ideally, like what Paul wrote to the Corinthians, ideally is your abundance supplies someone else's want. Yeah. And, and, and then someday, you never know, someday you might be the one with the want. <clears throat> you might be the one who's lacking and desperate. And they might be the one who comes and helps you. Like, you just never know, like, 20 years from now, how fortunes may change in people's lives. And maybe someday, you know, you're the one. Like Brian said, someday you're the one whose power is going to be out. And it's, it's, it's 18 degrees outside. Your pipes are frozen. Your power is out. And you're the one who needs warmth and, and water. So, you know, we show that love to other people because it's fitting. It's fitting. Luke? I think uh, an important point is to to think about in each person the prosperity that we all have. I mean, if you're honest with yourself, look back through your life and realize there's lots of times where mm -hmm. things went just the right way for yourself. Yeah. So I think that reflects the arrogance of Israel very well because yeah. during Jeroboam the second time, that Indian summer of Israel, it was not because they were some became some kind of great military power because of you know, all the great things that they did. Yeah. It was rather a vacuum of yeah. power from the, the nations around them. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's way more the um, circumstances that God is in control of. Yeah. It happened to be that way versus any kind of great thing that, that they did. And I think that's certainly true of all of us. We can look back at times in our lives where, you know, Something could have gone, you know, we got a job that we didn't anticipate or we met somebody that knew somebody that gained us, uh, you know, a, a better connection somewhere. Yeah. I mean, our lives are replete with that kind of stuff. And I think if we don't uh, have that inward uh, that introspection to be able to uh, realize that about ourselves, that God is responsible for all of those circumstances, yeah. good, or, I mean, good or bad, and those go both ways. But... Um, it gives us a lot more humility about where yeah. we are, how we got where we are, and therefore how we should uh, think of ourselves and others. Yeah, that it's not by my own hand that all this comes to me. And you're right, historically, uh, the, the reason why Jeroboam II and Uzziah as well, to a lesser extent, but the reason why they were so successful is partly they, they were they were they were good leaders. I mean, they were by earthly standards, they were intelligent and they took advantage of the situation and Jeroboam I think was a I think he was a very sharp very sharp person uh, but Assyria like I said in a couple classes ago uh, Assyria had a series of like really really weak kings there was a lot of internal strife which is at the same time interestingly enough that Jonah went and prophesied to them and I think the reason why Jonah had such an opportunity is that when Jonah goes and prophesies they have tons of internal strife in Assyria, and they have regressed as, as an empire. Their kingdom retracts significantly during this time. And Jonah shows up in Nineveh, and there's a very receptive populace there because their, their world is kind of crumbling around them. Their places, the world power is sort of waning. Um, and so where Assyria contracts, Israel comes in and says, Okay, <laughs> and they fill the void, and it's a it's an opportunity that Jeroboam takes. It's an opportunity that Uzziah takes in the southern tribes. When the same thing happens to Egypt, Egypt has kind of a series of problems, problematic leaders, and Uzziah just kind of like, well, okay, if you guys are leaving, then we'll just kind of, you know, retake the territory. So it was circumstance more than than genius. We got to be careful about that. So. Moving into chapter 7, 
chapter 7 through 9 is all about these uh, visions, right? God shows Amos some things, some interesting visions, and they're almost like, like parables, prophecies, and he starts with this. He shows in the first few verses here of chapter 7, he's going to show him some calamities and, and kind of go like, like what do you, Amos, what do you think about this one? No, 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 you can't do that one, God. Oh, all right, all right. What about this one? Let me show you something else. Let's read through it here, verse 1. Thus the Lord God showed me, and behold, he was forming a locust swarm when the spring crop began to sprout. And behold, the spring crop was after the king's mowing. Does that not sound like God, someone who is a farmer for a living? Like he's just kind of throwing in some like some little details there. Like probably didn't have to include that, but just like he just knows he's a farmer. He's a big farmer. Like he knows all this. He is someone who's a he's a farmer, and he just kind of throws this in there. And in verse 2, and it came about when it had finished eating the vegetation of the land that I said, Lord, God, please pardon. How can Jacob stand? For he is small. And the Lord changed his mind about this. It shall not be, said the Lord. Thus the Lord God showed me, and behold, the Lord God was calling to contend with them by fire. And it consumed the great deep and began to consume the farmland. And then I said, Lord, God, please stop. How can Jacob stand? For he is small. The Lord changed his mind about this. But this too shall not be, said the Lord God. Thus he showed me one more thing here. Behold, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a plumb line. So the Lord said, behold, I am about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be desolate. And the sanctuaries of Israel laid waste. Then shall I rise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So what do you take away from this? Like what seems to be the main point? Why does he, why does God show Amos like, what do you think about this, Amos? Oh, no, no, you can't do that. Oh, what about this? Oh, you can't do that. What seems to be what, what is God trying to show Amos here? And I think there are several answers, by the way, so don't be afraid to say something. There's going to be some desolation. Okay, so he does promise, in spite of the mercy that he shows, well, it's not going to be this, and it's not going to be that. In the end, will there still be desolation? Yeah. Okay, you know the old adage about out of the, out of the pan and into the fire? That, that, to me, that would be like a modern way of putting this. Like, well, it's not going to be a locust swarm and Amos Wipes the sweat from his brow. It's not going to be fire that consumes the farm Oh, good. Dodge the bullet. But Amos, trust me, it's coming. It is coming. Out of the pan, into the fire, seems to be what it says. What else? Yeah, there was some separation between Judah and Israel within that. Because he talks about Jacob. That's always hard to know which, which, uh, yeah. is, is, which nation is being referred to. But he says Jacob, so it makes me think. Maybe Judah gets spared, and that's the sparing, is that Israel is going to be wiped out, and Judah will stand. Because, I mean, that's kind of the remnant. You know, he never destroys Judah the way he did Israel. So. Yeah, so what what Luke is saying, if you couldn't hear him, is uh, there there is a there's a theory. I think there's a lot of merit to it, by the way, that if you track the use of the word Jacob, yeah, we, we often think of Jacob as being a synonym for Israel, because that, I mean, Jacob's name was changed to Israel after he wrestled with God. And so Jacob in the prophecies is often a stand-in, like a synonym for Israel. But there's a theory, and I, again, I think there's a lot of merit to it, that when God uses the word Jacob, he's using it in a much more vague spiritual sense than the term Israel, where Israel often is the nation itself. Jacob seems to be more of a kind of like a kind of like there's more of a spiritual element to it, more of a vague spiritual element to it. So I think it's possible when he talks about Jacob here in verse two and Jacob in verse five, how can Jacob stand? Maybe that's Amos appealing to God for show some mercy, show mercy to Jacob, to the remnant, show mercy to your actual people, that yes, there are people who claim to be Israel, and they're superficial, and they're idol worshipers, and they, they probably deserve everything that's coming to them, but 
please preserve Jacob. Preserve the, the elemental spiritual identity of your people. So I, there, I think there's some merit to that, and that could be what is going on there. Uh, Joe? Yeah, I think that's a reference to the plumb line, where the plumb line is the true standard for being upright. And yeah. Again, mm -hmm. in verse 7, he's saying, I'm putting the plumb line among the people. So, again, it's measuring the people, you know, I, you know, <clears throat> being upright, you know, ideally, the plumb line is the true standard for being upright. Yeah, and it is interesting how he, yeah, Amos appeals to Jacob. How can Jacob stand? And then when God responds in verses 7 through 9, um, he doesn't use Jacob in verse, in verse, uh, yes. Yeah, in verse 8, he says, I'm going to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. In verse 9, he talks about the high places of Isaac and the sanctuaries of Israel and the house of Jeroboam. So I think there, that, that's a theory that I think has some weight to it is Amos is saying, God, I, I know that this needs to happen. I know that you need to judge. I get it. I mean, He's here. He's traveled across the border at God's command to go preach to the northern tribes. So he gets it. God, I know this needs to happen, but please, how can Jacob stand? And so God comes in and his response is, I'm going to judge Israel. And I'm going to drop the plumb line. And the plumb line is the standard of truth. It will always tell you the truth. And I'll judge by that righteous standard. Israel will be judged. The high places of Isaac will be judged. The household of Jeroboam will be judged. But do we trust that the remnant of Jacob is always going to be preserved by God? Does God care about his remnant? Yes. Yes, he cares about his remnant. So, uh, again, I think there's, a, there's a, a lot of validity to that. In fact, you go on, um, go to chapter 9 and verse 8. Take a look at chapter 9 and verse 8 and look at the way he uses the word Jacob again here, chapter 9, verse 8 says, Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Nevertheless, I will not totally destroy, what? The house of Jacob. I will not destroy, totally destroy the house of Jacob. So there, there's again that, I'm going to judge, he says, the sinful kingdom, I'll judge Israel, the kingdom, but Jacob, the remnant, I won't totally destroy Jacob, the remnant. So, I, again, I think there's a lot of merit to that, to see it in that way. Tom? And then the verse says, I will not pass by them anymore. He's basically saying, I gave you your opportunity. I see what yeah. you're doing. This is the cutoff. This is the righteous. This is the cutoff for the deal. Yeah, great point. Yeah, this is, and the plumb line never lies. The plumb line never lies. Missy, you can have the last word. I just think through this as a parent, when I read through this, I think of patience. They're not patient to learn then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Um, you still love and have mercy on your children, mm -hmm. but there comes a time when um, you run out of patience. Yeah. And you must act. Yes. Miss Ed is right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On on Wednesday we'll wrap things up. We'll get to chapter eight and chapter nine. There's a really great messianic element to the end of the book that leaves us on a high note. So if you're feeling if you're feeling down, well, Amos is working, but he's not gonna leave us on a low note. He leaves us on a high note, I promise. So we'll go to wrap up Amos on Wednesday night. Thank you so much, everybody.